Another day, another video about bedroom stuff. Today we talk about the old Japanese tradition of shudo, the way of youths. It was the art of loving young men, very young men. Male-male relationships in Japan before the modern era were mostly between men and much younger boys. Some of your favorite samurai participated, as we'll see later. Sex between males was called nanshoku. The Japanese believed that the monk Kukai, the founder of Shingon Buddhism in Japan, brought over a nanshoku from China in the year 806. Like he went to China, happened to see two men having sex, came back and said, Hey, have you guys heard about dick? That's not true, of course. Nanshoku did not come from China via a Buddhist monk. It came from yaoi anime. No. Every culture had men who slept with men to some degree. But in the minds of people, Buddhism and Nanshoku were attached at the hip. If you think it's weird that Buddhism would have anything to do with male sex, well, prepare to have your Buddhism cherry popped. Monks lived in their temples under vows of celibacy. Buddhism, a well-known hater of fun, forbade its monks from sleeping with women or men. But those two things were not equal. Which do you think was the more serious crime? Sleeping with women or sleeping with men? Take a guess. If you're wrong, you'll have to click like and type I love this video in the comments. Look, I didn't make the rules, I just enforced them with joy. If you guessed this one was worse, you're wrong. Accept your punishment. You're probably thinking of Europe. This is Japan. Sleeping with women was scary and dangerous. Monks who strayed suffered harsh punishments. Some regions even had laws executing monks for it. But there was barely any punishment for sleeping with other men. It was a lesser evil. And so they chose the lesser evil. Temples were full of sexually frustrated monks walking around with muscular forearms, ready to explode at any moment. Having sex with other men was still against the rules, but it was like pushing an old lady out of the way on a crowded bus. You know it's wrong, but at some point, you just gotta get off. They saw nanshoku, sex between males, as an outlet for their urges. The consequence? Nanshoku went viral in Buddhist temples. Literally, they all had STDs. But the male love that happened in temples wasn't the sort between adult men. The monks were more into sex with their younger boy acolytes. These were boys who grew up in the temples, learning scriptures, doing chores, and occasionally warming the beds of older monks. Buddhist monks became known for nanshoku. One writer joked, the priest goes to Yoscho in his everyday garb. I love explaining jokes, so Yoscho was a pleasure district known for male prostitutes. Medieval George Carlin is saying that a Buddhist monk visiting male prostitutes was so common they didn't even have to wear a disguise, unlike if he were visiting female ones. Even Yamabushi, who were mountain priests that did not live in temples, gained a reputation for being boy lovers. There was a saying about them, acolytes first, the mountain god second. Nanshoku spread from the monastery to the battlefield, the realm of the samurai, likely because samurai families sent their sons to monasteries to study, where they learned about nanshoku the hard way. And so the tradition of shudo arose among the samurai, the way of youths. Way meaning like a philosophy or an art, like the art of sword fighting, which it kinda is. Leave it to the Japanese to turn sex into an art form to perfect. In shudo, an adult man formed a romantic relationship with a youth. A youth was called a wakashu. I have a video all about the life of wakashu. But basically, the male life cycle was like that of butterflies. Like how caterpillars became pupa before becoming butterflies, boys became wakashu before becoming adult men. Wakashu were generally around 11 years old to about mid-20s. Ages varied, but they were not considered boys. It was a stage after childhood. In a shudo relationship, the man was a mentor. He taught the wakashu how to grow up to be a samurai, and occasionally how to grow his little samurai. The wakashu was like an apprentice in the worst internship ever. Some of your favorite samurai had one or more young male lovers. Oda Nobunaga famously had Mori Ranmaru. Toyotomi Hideyoshi and Miyamoto Musashi also followed the way of youths. Actually, just name a famous samurai. He probably practiced shudo. It seemed like the norm among samurai. You think of these warlords as badasses, but apparently they were a bunch of delicate flowers. Takeda Shingen had at least one love triangle with two wakashu. There was a document where he swore to his main lover that he never slept with this other wakashu. He only talked to his side hoe, honest. He invited the gods to strike him down if he ever became unfaithful. Plot twist, bastard was probably lying. It was in the Edo period that the popularity of Shudo climaxed. It spread to commoners in the cities. People started writing about it in flowery language. The way was open to all. 
Writers wrote about shoot-all ideals and proper behaviors and what to do in the bedroom, even fun positions. They put a fancy kimono on what was basically men sleeping with boys. Shoot-all relationships were one-sided. The man was supposed to thirst after the wakashu and not the other way around, but it's not clear how much people followed this. There were examples of wakashu yearning for a man or giving hints to men they liked. Writers worshipped the forelock, that unique hair that all wakashu wore, and it became an erotic symbol. They also oiled their spears over the furisore, a type of kimono that wakashu wore. 15 to 17 was considered the age where a wakashu was most beautiful, known as the springtime of youth. Now you know what Gai Sensei was talking about. No, Gai Sensei, no! After springtime, wakashu were called falling flowers, a poetic way of saying they got more hideous by the day. Men were supposed to dress well and clean their teeth. Bad breath was un all like because no self-respecting wakashu would ever go for men with bad breath. Some writers encouraged wakashu to lightly powder their faces white, like women did. Shudo couples had fun ways of expressing their love. Some exchanged vows and sewed them onto their clothing, so the vow was always next to their skin. More serious public displays of affection involved tattoos, cutting off hair, cutting the skin to make a scar, pulling fingernails, and the ultimate expression of love, the one for real genuine couples who were not compensating at all, cutting off a finger. Sex was also one-sided. The main sex act was through the bum. The man was always the top, never the bottom. Wakashu were not supposed to like sex. Infiltrating the rear entrance was generally seen as displeasing. Wakashu mostly endured it for the sake of their partner. This does not mean that wakashu were forced into shudal relationships. They had the power to reject men's advances and shared the bed willingly. Even though they didn't like penetrative sex, it doesn't mean they were coerced. They agreed to sex for reasons other than pleasure, like duty, compassion, or wanting to give their partners pleasure. Both sides seemed genuine. That's why there existed the curious cases of love suicides. These were Romeo and Romeo cases where both the man and the wakashu killed themselves due to love. Although you have to ask, for really young wakashu, did they understand what they were getting themselves into? No, of course not. They were kids. Why would you ask that? There were sex guides teaching people the way of the bedroom, like always carry around plums that were pre-cut in case you ever needed lubrication. Wait, what? How often did they run into situations where they had to penetrate in a pinch? Books described all kinds of positions that are just too dirty to talk about, but I did learn of two methods that shattered my innocence. Still not describing them, you dirty viewer, but they were called dry insertion and tearing the hole and were designed to cause the wakashu as much pain as possible. But, but why though? One writer cautioned that if you withdrew your turtle head covered in poop, it would cause health issues. I only mention this advice because turtle head is a wonderful euphemism. If you're Jewish, you may not understand. Some critics of shudal sex said it caused more hemorrhoids, but defenders said, yeah, but it also made the anus more flexible. I don't really understand why that's a positive. Kissing was actually considered very intimate. People didn't usually kiss during foreplay. They did it while in the peak of sweaty passion. Pseudo porn exploded all over the capital, spattering pictures of male-on-male -male action everywhere. Forla Cub was born. Now with all the art and the writings about proper shoot all ideals, we gotta keep in mind that these were mostly made for men. A lot of them were male fantasies, especially the art. It's hard for historians to tell how much they followed these ideals in practice. It'd be like watching porn and thinking that sex happens when your stepsister gets stuck under the bed. No, you're supposed to pull your stepsis out from her predicament and then sleep with her. Some samurai lords took pride in having an entourage of beautiful young page boys and sandal bearers, like they were some kind of hentai Pokemon collection. That's right, sandal bearers, people who carried their lords' sandals around, often carried them right into the bedroom. The fifth shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi, was a big ol' horn dog. He slept with over a hundred different wakashu. He appointed an official whose job was to find him cute wakashu. Imagine working hard for the shogunate your entire life, only to end up pimping out boys for your lord. He housed his wakashu in nearby buildings. They were supposed to be ready every evening in case he fancied them. Now I thought I knew a lot about the perviest supernatural creature, the kappa, the pervert squirtle. But I just discovered that they believed that the kappa could enter a man's butt and ignite in him the passion for male-male sex. I'm not clear if entering meant penetration or it literally crawled into your butt. Must do more research. These shoot-all writers were out of control. 
The chrysanthemum is the symbol of the Japanese imperial family. It's a sacred symbol. These degenerate writers made it the symbol for male-male love because the inner part of the flower looked like the opening of a butt. I don't really see it, but I don't have an eye for these things. Alright, this is important, so pay attention. It has to do with their sexuality. One question people often ask is, were they gay or bisexual? If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me that question, I'd have two dollars. But it's kind of the wrong question to ask. Here's why. Most of us are used to viewing sexuality this way, the boring way. If you're a man and you're attracted to women, you're heterosexual. If you're attracted to men, you're homosexual. And if you're attracted to both, you're really fun. Unfortunately, when you try to ram that model into Japan in the adult period, it doesn't fit. Let's take a typical adult man. He's attracted to women. So he's straight. But he's also attracted to wakashu. Okay, okay, so he's bisexual. But he's not attracted to men. Uh... Then, as he grows older, he loses interest in wakashu and becomes attracted to women. Uh, what the hell is he? Okay, calm down, me. Look, they didn't think there were two types of sexual partners, male and female. They thought in terms of three, male, female, and wakashu. Each point of the sex triangle had a different role in the bedroom and in society. That's why some historians called wakashu a third gender. So, men could sleep with wakashu. Their relationship was one way, meaning the object of desire was the wakashu, not the man. The man wanted the wakashu sexually, not the other way around. Men could also sleep with women, and men were not obligated to stay monogamous. Now, he could only have one wife, but he could sleep with other partners. The relationship between man and wife was two-way. They both desired each other. Also, men didn't sleep with other men. Now, we're only talking about sexual norms here, okay? How people were supposed to act. But you always had people breaking these norms. And this doesn't even include prostitutes, which made things even messier. But don't they always? And just to be clear, men did not see wakashu as substitutes for women. Wakashu had a more masculine or androgynous beauty, different from the feminine beauty of women. Shudo relationships were associated with masculinity, like grr. It came from the warrior tradition, after all. Women could sleep with men and wakashu before marriage, but after marriage, they stayed monogamous with their husband. The relationship between women and wakashu was two-way. Sleeping with other women wasn't a recognized union. Wakashu could sleep with men or women, but in a shudal relationship, it wasn't clear if they had to stay monogamous. Some shudal writers said yes, others disagreed. Funny thing is, even if the couple agreed to be monogamous, they could still sleep with other women. Seems it was only called cheating if the wakashu slept with another man, or the man slept with another wakashu. There was also this phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon that adult men started off their adulthood being attracted to wakashu, but as they got older, they slowly shifted their preference to women. After men got married, they preferred mostly women. Men older than 30 who still chased wakashu tail were frowned upon. Shudo was seen as something you did as a young adult, but grew out of. You could still do it as an old man, no one would stop you, you just wouldn't be acting your age. To use modern words, it was like a man started out gay, became bi, and then became straight. It seems bonkers. Nowadays, we tend to think of sexuality as identity, as something that's fixed. But that's why our modern ideas of sexuality don't fit. The Japanese didn't have these concepts. They did not think of their sexual orientation as identity. They didn't self-identify by who they had sex with. A woman sleeping with a man did not make her straight, and sleeping with another woman did not make her a lesbian. Sex was something they did, not who they were. So men switching from gay to straight was like watching hentai when you're young, then switching to real respectable porn when you grow up. All good things come to a happy ending, and bad things too. In the latter half of the Edo period, pseudo popularity deflated. Some even called it a vulgar practice from an earlier age. It got less and less popular until it died in the Meiji period. The government adopted western hairstyles and clothing, which eliminated the wakashu's famous forelock and clothing. Western dress and hairstyles reinforced the male-female dichotomy. In some cases, the authorities aggressively suggested people wear western hairstyles by cutting off people's top knots. Under the Meiji government, only sex between married men and women was acceptable, and male-male or female-female sex became obscene, enforced by law. For more about the crazy lives of wakashu, check out this video here. We have some new Patreon patrons this week. Cody Bouquet, that rolls right off the tongue. Miguel Alvarez and Elizabeth McDonald. I love your restaurant. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.